We have heard this week that the coronation of King Charles III will take place on Saturday the 6th of May 2023 in Westminster Abbey, the place that English kings have been crowned in since the time of William the Conqueror. The last time we saw a sovereign of the United Kingdom crowned in Westminster Abbey was of course the late Queen's coronation in 1953, nearly 70 years ago. But the King will be crowned alongside his wife Camilla, his Queen Consort, and the last time a Queen Consort was crowned was of course in 1937, when Queen Elizabeth was crowned alongside her husband King George VI. Is there anyone alive now who remembers or witnessed that? So coronations have in many respects passed out of our collective memory in the United Kingdom. The man who is charged with organising the King's coronation, the Earl Marshal, the Duke of Norfolk, wasn't even born in 1953 when the previous coronation took place. We're hearing this week lots of press reports suggesting that the coronation will be what they refer to as a slimmed down coronation. How I hate that phrase. Um, The United Kingdom still has a strong streak of Puritanism in its culture. It both loves and it loathes pomp and ceremony in equal measure. And every time there's a public ceremony of this sort, it results in this streak in British culture coming to the fore. The coronation will certainly be different to that of previous coronations in many outward respects. As like all good forms of ritual, it is not preserved in aspic. It has been an ever-changing ceremony, evolving to reflect both the political reality of the age and also the mood of the nation. The United Kingdom is quite different constitutionally and socially than it was in 1953, and that might well drive some change. In 1953, the hereditary peers, the Dukes, Marquesses, Earls, Viscounts and Barons, still had a constitutional role as part of the legislature, as part of Parliament. Now, most of them are no longer members of the House of Lords, which is primarily made up of appointed life peers. It is difficult to see how you could justify the presence of all hereditary peers and peeresses at the coronation if they have no public role in the political life of the nation. It will be interesting to see who will replace them, as they surely will be replaced. A lot of the powers of the Parliament of the United Kingdom in Westminster have also been devolved over the last 25 years to the individual nations that make up the United Kingdom. Scotland has its own parliament, Wales has a senate, and there is a power-sharing assembly in Northern Ireland. Will their role be reflected in the coronation? There may well be a change to the form of some of the robes. I suspect the sea of crimson and ermine robes and gilt metal coronets, first introduced in the late 17th century, will be considerably reduced. In 1953, Very few people had any objection to fur farming. I can't see that the creation of new robes lined and edged with yards and yards of ermine would go down very well with the general public in the United Kingdom in 2023. Elizabeth II's coronation was of course the first to be televised, but so much has moved on technologically since then. That's a bit of an understatement. At previous coronation, galleries were erected all over the Abbey so that as many of the social elite as possible could be crammed in there to witness firsthand the splendour of the ceremony. With television and the internet, there is no need to fill Westminster Abbey with people. Millions, perhaps billions of people, will be able to witness this ceremony through their television, computer screens and mobile phones. There's been much talk in the press this week too that lengthy ceremonies such as the offering of gold ingots to the sovereign will be jettisoned. This sort of musing is of course clickbait. The aim of the press with this sort of comment is to get people's backs up during a cost of living crisis. It also shows how ill-informed the press are. A gold ingot is not offered to the king. The king offers a gold ingot on a plate, an action that takes a matter of seconds to Westminster Abbey as part of the offertory during the Holy Communion. And another story in the press this week focuses on the colonial overtones of at least one aspect of the coronation. When Elizabeth II was crowned, India had only recently achieved independence and she was still the Queen of Pakistan and of other places like the Union of South Africa. The United Kingdom, like many Western nations, is grappling with its colonial past and how to place that in a proper context. 
there is some comment at the present about the uh, possible use of the Queen Mother's crown to crown the Queen Consort, as it contains the very much disputed Cohen or Diamond given to Queen Victoria right at front and centre. Now, this sort of issue won't phase the monarchy at all. The monarchy will adapt. Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother's crown, was made new in 1937, and there have been a whole series of consorts crown going back in history. There is no good reason why a new crown cannot be provided or the previous one remade without the inclusion of the Kohenor. After all, the imperial state crown worn by the king will also be altered for him. We will see many more details emerge over the course of the next few months, but regardless of the many changes in this ever-evolving ceremony, I don't think the central core of the coronation will change at all. This is a very ancient ceremony that goes back to Anglo-Saxon England. There are five major ceremonial actions that have always been at the very centre of the coronation from the earliest days. These are the recognition, the anointing, the investiture, the crowning and the enthroning. These will not change. And incidentally, they can't realistically be performed in just one hour. The details of the rest of the rite have always moved around a bit and have always been up for negotiation. For example, it is usual for the coronation to take place in the context of an Anglican service of Holy Communion, at which the Sovereign and the Queen Consort receive communion. In the Middle Ages, it was of course set in the context of the Catholic Mass. And in 1685, when James II, an openly Catholic Sovereign, was crowned, he did not receive Holy Communion at all. That openness to change within the context of tradition is why in Britain we have continued to have a coronation rather than the sort of stiflingly dull inauguration that other European monarchs have. Please, God forbid, we don't end up with something like that. The cost and lavishness of the coronation has also differed according to the nation's circumstances. Sometimes the crown detects the mood of the nations with respect to budget. Sometimes it fails to do so. When the spendthrift George IV was crowned in 1821, the former Prince Regent, a coronation in which he was trying to outdo the imperial coronation of the defeated Napoleon, it was the most expensive coronation ever. When his brother, William IV, succeeded in 1830, he was sensible enough to realise that public feeling would not take too kindly to seeing a repeat of such lavish expenditure for a 60-year-old monarch and a budget version took place. In times past, the coronation would end with a lavish banquet in Westminster Hall, during which the King's champion would ride into the hall on the back of a horse with the Earl Marshal and the Lord Constable, and would challenge anyone to a fight who claimed the sovereign was not the rightful king. Now that banquet and that picturesque medieval scene were jettisoned in 1830, and were never revived. Now, the king's champion, one of the dimmicks of Scrivelsby in Lincolnshire, is relegated to carrying a banner in the coronation procession, and the sovereign goes back to Buckingham Palace to appear to their people on the balcony. Now, that balcony appearance of Buckingham Palace, which we now see as an integral part of the coronation and of every major royal event today, was only introduced for the first time in 1937. Traditions are always being made anew. I have no doubt that the Crown will judge the mood of the people. We are in a financial crisis at the moment in the UK and we will see, I'm sure, a balancing of both splendour and economy. But not too much economy, I hope. We are a nation with a deep history and as the comments box on this channel shows, people the world over love British history. And as we saw at the funeral of Her Late Majesty, the United Kingdom does ceremonial so well. Today, this video begins a new series I'm going to offer called The Coronation in Focus. Over the course of the next nine months, I want to invite you to explore with me in quite some depth the history and origins of this extraordinary ceremony, the purpose of all its key moments, the architectural setting of it, the major figures involved in the coronation and their roles and responsibilities, and of course the dazzling array of objects and artefacts used in the coronation, the crowns and the other extraordinary items that form the British regalia. The videos won't be in any particular order, I'm afraid, 
but they will all be placed in a playlist called The Coronation in Focus. I really hope you enjoyed the series and thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.